And uh, well, before I begin, I'd like to, as I should, thanks Dennis and Annette and Christina and all of the all of the team of ESPD and of course the owners of this house that have hosted up in such a wonderful place. Yeah, I uh, was remembering earlier how we had a meeting that Dennis went and in San Luis Potosí and they put us up in a in a semi-abandoned hotel. <laughs> the, the stunk of whatever, so to be here in such luxury is, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, can I move around much? Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Okay, so, this is not obeying. Yeah, maybe I have it backwards, hold on. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Okay, since this is a talk that I, I assume that some of you might need some introduction to the area and to pre-Columbian history. Okay, so let me, uh, the Central Andes, more or less the area that in terms of today's countries goes from halfway into Ecuador to into Chile, all the way down to like San Pedro de Atacama. And there in what is equivalent to the European Middle Ages. No. You, you can just say next slide, I'll do it second. Okay, next. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier that way. So during that period, there were two large entities. I, I don't want to call it empires or nations or, because it doesn't apply. It, it's not an empire in the sense of the Roman Empire of occupying territory at large. This, rem, remember, the first thing to remember when dealing with this area of the Andes is that it's a, it's a vertical area. So that if you have a, if you have an, 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 your big city, let's say it's Tiwanaku, that is about almost 13,000 feet high. So you have to procure resources from a whole set of like vertical, vertical occupation. So what these people tried to do was establish outposts at different altitudes to get resources from the coast, to get resources from the middle areas like corn, and then elevating until you get higher and you have llamas and alpacas and so forth. So basically you can see a people that are living on marine resources and people high up that are doing more meat, if you want to. So, so when they establish what, the colonies, there is quite a bit of difference between these two people. Okay. Uh, the, the Wadi people in the north occupied that vast territory that included what would, that will be uh, like the culture like Nazca, and Paracas in that area, and then Tiwanaco down in the mountains, and that whole area all the way to San Pedro de Atacama, that it's the place in the world, in anywhere in the Americas with the highest concentration of, 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 of psychedelic use. Uh, in San Pedro de Atacama, that is where I work, we have approximately 511 snuffing kids. You know, I'll, I'll show you what it is. And, so you for what is nothing kid is comprised. So we have excavated cemeteries in that area where for every three burials of, ma of males, one person has psychedelic equipment with him. I say male not because the women did not really snuff, but the women didn't seem to have taken the paraphernalia to the grave. So we're gonna say, no, the women didn't do it. No, I, I think it's... Yeah, you know, so the, the, the women didn't take it, you know. Hey, why would, you know, in a way, if you look at it from an atheist point of view, why would they need, why would they need it, you know? Uh, so, anyway, so uh, after that, okay, and I, let me have the next slide. Pardon me. Okay, what is it? Oh, okay. And I can move around freely. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. I don't like to talk like this, folks. I like to move around, so I feel caged up if I don't. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so to explain you a little bit about chronology, of this, <laughs> chronology of this area, okay. You have a period that is 
the early formative where you have places like Cerro Sachin and Caral, which is not here. And then you come the, in the 50s. This archaeologist, John Rowe, proposed this chronology. And it holds pretty good still. I mean, there are things that you might argue about it, but basically you can sort of trust it. So he established what he called horizons, meaning that he would see, let's say in the case of, of Chavin, he would say he would see objects with Chavin iconography that are spread over a vast area. And every time he would find these objects, he would include it as part of this horizon. Then around you know, 100 before Christ or, or about year zero, Chavin sort of collapses and you don't find that iconography anymore. So what follows then is what Rowe would call the early intermediate period, where there are only regional developments. There are no unifying iconographies spreading over the vast area. So that period lasts, you know, a good 800, 900 years. And then it, and then things start starting, like Tiwanaku starts early, like a little about, you know, the time of Christ. And then, then Wadi comes along and it, they spread all over. You can find Tiwanaku objects all the way down to San Pedro de Atacama. San Pedro lies, to make your geography easier, San Pedro lies right on the Tropic of Capricorn. The Tropic of Capricorn passes a, a few miles south from the oasis, 10, 15 miles south of the oasis. And it's where the better passes to go across the Andes are. And then they sort of restrain to that area and Wadi, which is much more militaristic if you compare it with San Pedro, uh, it spreads like that. And they send emissaries and they establish outposts. And it's a, it's a, it's a I, I'm prejudiced about it. I studied Iwanako, so I, so, but Wadi tends to be a more dictatorial and domineering uh, type of government. That's where they differ one from the other extremely. So we will see all the difference and whatever. But then comes Wadi, Tiwanaku. Then Wadi and Tiwanaku collapse. There seem to have been a large climate problem. And there is a big drought that sets in in the, in the late 900s and it lasts for about 120 years. So you figure that this is already a dry area. And if you get a drought that lasts a century, everything collapses. And you can see it, all of the, the, all of the big cultures, like the Moche goes down, uh, Tiwanaku goes down, everybody down. Uh, and the problem with that is that all the trade routes, or trade route, R-O-U-T-E-S, routes, routes, how do you pronounce it, Root routes? They all get disrupted. So all of the flow of goods get disrupted and is restricted to regional areas. And then all that remains like that in that kind of regional development until the Inca come around. And the Inca start coming out of their territory around the late 1300s. And they start expanding and expanding. And they go, they go all the way into Colombia. And they go all the way into South Central Chile, south of, of the capital of Chile, Santiago. So it's a huge thing that develops there. And that is what you might call a true empire, because they occupy territory. And they, they, they impose their language, they move people around to, to establish, the, yeah, they take people from a community here, and they take it to another, where they, they, they take Quechua speakers and move it into territories occupied, and that way, by control of language, in a way, they start domineering the different sections. Okay, now, let me have the next slide, please. So I'm going to, I'm going to compare what, what, the way I'm going to proceed. I'm going to define a certain uh, set of things that is important for the argument I'm going to make. Uh, and Wari and Tiwanaku are very similar, but they also differ radically in other things. Okay, so. Uh, Tiwanaku, there is abundance, evidence for nothing, while in Wadi, the emphasis is on, on drinking chicha, on drinking beer, uh, with a, it's very, a lot of varieties, a lot of different plants are used, uh, and so forth. Then, other, I'll go more in detail into it in a minute. Then, other things is that 
in the Tiwanaku sphere of influence. It's nothing paraphernalia, which I'll show you in a minute, is distributed over this vast area. But it's also monumental stone sculptures and stairways, and monumental stone buildings all over. While in Wadi, that is not the case. Like while at Tiwanaku you have this emphasis in large spaces with open plazas that imply ritual movement. In Wadi, that does not happen. Wadi architecture, in a way, it seems to be designed to limit movement and to limit large gatherings. Right. And then uh, the, 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 the architectural stuff, the, the stone cutting of Tiwanaku is superb, really. Uh, if you've seen it, it in, it's the subject of many documentaries in the History Channel or whatever as to how uh, our extraterrestrials made them cut this and whatever. Because it's really perfection in the cut. When you see the, the, the stone cut is like that. So, so, it's perfect and they fit into one another. And then Wadi architecture is more rough cut stone. Okay. And, okay. and then in Tiwanaku there is this emphasis on semi-subterranean plazas or sunken plazas. The plazas are well, sometimes not so much as this, but taller than me, there is not much to say, but you know, they, and since they were smaller than me, so it fits. Uh, they are, so they are like sunken plazas. Uh, which I'll show you photos of all of that. And then there is a big difference, see, because there is the emphasis in this expansion of people using portable uh, things that can be moved, and that's how the ideology is spread. So Tiwanaku has, and as well as Wadi, they both have. Uh, really spectacular textiles. But the textiles of, of Tiwanaku tend to be both warp and weft, tend to be out of camelid fiber. Wool, I guess it's not wool, properly speaking, it's camelid fiber. While in Wadi, the warp is, is cotton and the weft is camelid fiber. So they have a, they have a, a, a dislocation in the state of preservation because cotton last less than, than, than wool. So you see that how they decompose. And also the wari, this is kind of technical, but Tiwanaku tunics are complete. They wrap you around, but wari have a seam in the middle, like this. I guess for the practicality of a loom. Remember, these are, pra these are backstrap looms that, according to some colonial drawings, it could be as wide as this. So it's, it's, it's a, and if, you want to, if one wanted to be a stereotype, if you say, what is the really typical art of the Andes? One well, would say it's textiles. Textiles are the, the main art in the central Andes. Spectacular things. Okay. And then, they, in Tiwanaku, there's no evidence for colonial outpost. There, is, there are Tiwanaku objects, but no people accompanying those objects. And what is the opposite of that? There are full burials, let's say, of Tiwanaku, of Wadi people with the burial in the style of Wadi, the dresses in Wadi, all the way through the south coast, in, in, through Paracas and Nazca, in the areas of Wadi occupation. So the occupation is totally different in one from the other. Okay. And then, the, it's sort of, I would better say, in Tiwanaku is an ideological expansion, we'll go more into that, and with no colonial outpost, while the opposite in Wadi, like in San Pedro de Atacama, that is the, southernmost limits of Tiwanaku expansion. We have no, no Tiwanaku people. We have the objects that have arrived, but no, no one from the outside. So that's why I said it's an ideological expansion, because there's no militaristic outposts, there are no fortifications uh, at all. It's kind of strange, because when Wari and Tiwanaku interface, there seems to have been no conflict at the border. Somehow or another, the Wadi people seem to have had, uh, the same for the Tiwanaku people, they seem to have no interest in displacing one another from this border area. This is one of the big questions in pre-Columbian art history. What is the relationship between these two people? Well, how come there were 700 years there and there does not seem to have been any major conflict? Okay. Now, we have the next slide, please. Okay. So, but they do share a basic iconography. This is the basic vocabulary of Tiwanaku and Wadi iconography. These little elements combine to present these large themes, or these stories, so to speak. 
And so and there are, this is the range, and they all repeat themselves throughout. But they built, let me have the next one, please. They, they built, this is Tiwanaku, this is Wadi. Okay. And they all see how the dress of these people are composed of those elements. Okay. It's sort of like, like a language, not a language in the sense of, of phonetic structures, but more like a narrative. Like it's like if you take, for, ex for example, you take, a, 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 this is, this would be a basic. there is the Cathedral of Mossack, the Romanesque Cathedral, where if you enter for the South Portal, you see over here, high up, a, a woman in a donkey carrying a child and a man pulling the donkey. If you are an educated Christian from the Romanesque period, you immediately, just by glancing at it, you know, so that's the flight into Egypt. But not only would you know that that's the flight into Egypt, but you would know why they are fleeing to Egypt, who is this child, what would happen to this child later on, and all the consequences. So you know, from one image, you know the whole story. And I don't think that the Romanesque people were unique. This is the same here. Here you have this frontal staff holding figure. I don't think they are deities. Normally you see all oh, the staff, the staff deity. You know, they, I think they are just uh, special human beings, you know, fancy ancestral shamans uh, and so forth. And they are always surrounded by attendants that sometimes are fully human, sometimes they are, have animal characteristics, like here. And then you see uh, in Wadi the same. And, and there are a lot of varieties of this, but this, they share this basic iconography, okay? which is not surprisingly, if you look at Christianity, again, Christianity, you have, they, they might, like a church in Harlem, might have the, the same iconography of a crucifixion and stuff as the one you would find in a church in Rome. So they, they share the iconography, but they are, somewhat different, <laughs> you would say, than that. So I think something like that's going on. So, the, so that similitude stays in the iconography and doesn't reflect the political situation later. Let me have the next one. Okay. So this is a, a, another example of that. This is a snuff tray, and that's a textile. This is a textile from the middle of nowhere, a place called Pulacayo in Bolivia that seemed to have been a resting stop in the caravan routes. Uh, the, this whole area of the Andes was trekked by fairly large caravans uh, of llamas taking loads from one place to another. And this lasted until the 20th century. You see 50 llamas more uh, carrying goods, but remember, llamas cannot be overloaded or they refuse to go. They just bend their nut and they fall, and you, they won't, go, won't get up again unless you remove the cargo. So they're, they're brighter than, than camels, I guess. Well, they are camels. Llamas and alpacas are camelids. Okay. So, but here you can see, you, can you understand? Let me read it for you if you want to. The, this is a figure like this. See, genuflect, holding a staff up front. In this case, see the foot, the knee bent over like that, then the body, the head looking up with this thing coming out of his mouth, holding a staff, and in the back here, an ax with a blade up and a head. This is like a sacrificer person. The same in this other one. It's a really obscure to see, but you see the, the, the legs bending out, the ax with the blade up, the head, then a big crown like this guy, and then looking up, with a thing coming out of his mouth that generally is, is said is singing. But one time with, with Luis Eduardo Luna at home, he came to visit with Pablo Amaringo. And I showed Pablo, and I said, this might be that they are singing. And Pablo said, no, 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 that's the, the magical phlegm, he said, you know, that uh, Amazonian shamans use. I mean, it's, okay, you know, it's, it's hard to prove one way or another. But uh, Pablo said, no, no, immediately said, no, no, that's not it. That's the, how do you call it? Yachai. 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 Uh, uh, and he was really, uh, um, you know, emphatic on that. I don't know, I prefer still to think is, is that it's a, a speech that's flowing out of their mouth. But who knows? And then what, uh, what it tends to be more geometric. You see how in the registers the, the figure has been compressed and it's become more into this frame. Okay. You'll see that more and more. Okay, next one. 
Then, now to do that, but I had the shisha, the Wadi people prefer drinking. But when I'm saying drinking and feasting, this is what they would do. It, it is, I don't know if you've ever seen an Andean feast of drinking. It's serious drinking. It, it's not just, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's serious days of drinking, several days of drinking. When, when in San Pedro de Atacama, St. Peter days rolls around, if it's on the weekend, People start drinking immediately from Friday all the way till Monday. People are collapsing on the street because chicha, I don't know if you ever drank it, but I'm not a drinker. But chicha, is, to me, it's like you put a piece of lead in my head. So, but these people, I don't know how they can, how they can drink so much. You know, I've seen people have peeing competition on the street. And, man, how can you know, pee more? It's, kind of, it's a crazy feast. And food, and everybody shares food. But see, this is key here, because if you have these interactions, this is where I invite you, and you, and I serve you, and, and I serve you in a certain order. And that is, that is implying hierarchies. So that I serve you first, and then Jeronimo, and then you, and then establishes a, a hierarchy in the structure of things. And the more I feed you, the more you owe me. And so people start having this reciprocal arrangement, so that if I do you something, you would, uh, you would have to reciprocate. And sometimes you cannot. It's like, uh, like in the Northwest Coast, you, you cannot. I ruin you by doing this in a way. So but these obligations then are created in many ways. Today, a, a, a real normal one is that a family asks you to be the godparent of one of their children. So that, you know, you, you become part of that family and you have certain obligations with that family, that they become hard to, to... For me, I'm not the most social type, so that it creates a situation where, you know, at least I feel at odds with that, you know, so that we have our goddaughter that we have taken it to Miami and spent time with us as a way of reciprocating. I don't know how good that reciprocation is, but we, we've done that to meet our to meet our obligations, as you might call it. So there are these big collective situations where relationships are developed, okay? and where you get affiliations of the local regional people to your larger empire. Okay? Then uh, chicha is, uh, is, is a beer, and it is many plants are used depends on the region where you are. The most common today is chicha de jora, which is basically chicha with ferment or germinated corn that has a lot more sugars and it makes for a stronger drink. But this is like three, five percent. It's not like a, not even close to, to a strong wine. It's, yeah, three, five percent is the most of that it has. So, uh, but different herbs and seeds are added to the chicha brew. One that I've been looking at lately is the addition of an adenantra seeds into, into the beer, which the ethanol, as many of you probably know, produces beta carbolines. And if you get real drunk the next morning when you pee, your, your, your urine is full of, of beta carbolines. So that allows the tryptamines in the adenantra to act. So making effectively what you could see as an ayahuasca analog, and from my point of view, it, if one was to investigate the origins of ayahuasca, that would be the area to focus on, on, the, on, this, on this way, because people always wonder how did they discover this combination, but this combination of different plants is common throughout the Andes in, since the early pre-Columbian days. So people always knew, so when they tell you, oh, ayahuasca has always been here, maybe not the recipe that we know, the recipe common today of Banisteriopsis and Chacruna, but the idea underlying all this, that, that the combination of plants serve to modulate the effect, is something that people have always known. Okay. Uh, but the, the recipes of ayahuasca we use today, my opinion is, they are no older than 500 years in, in this recipe of ayahuasca. Some people like to feel, I mean, I don't, you know, sometimes people try to stress how ancient things are. But in a way, it's kind of negative, because if, if things were to be real ancient, ancient, well, we are really doing bad, because it means, what have we gained in, in this antiquity? Not much. Look at how disaster our world is today. So it's, it reflects on the human condition, I think. So 
They, these are regular serving, serving ware that you find in the breweries. I'll show you a brewery later. Let me have the next one. Okay. So uh, this is an Anadenanthera tree, Anadenanthera colubrina. The one, there's two, gen two species in the genus. One is northern, the gross. In, it doesn't like jungle. It likes open savannas. And this is the one that grows in the south. And peregrina is the one that grows in the northern part. Uh, peregrina is the one that when Columbus comes in 1492 and lands in the, what is today the, in Hispaniola, uh, this is what he sees. This is, Columbus, uh, if you are not familiar with the work of Ramon Panet, Columbus has a priest that comes with him in his second trip. And in 1494, he leaves Pané in the Dominican Republic and returns to pick him up like four years later. So Pané stays by himself in the Dominican Republic, well, in the border with Haiti and Dominican Republic, and stays there. He learns Taino languages and records all the writings in a book that you can find online. It's Chronicles of the Antiquities of the Indians by Ramon Pané, P-A-N-E, with an accent in the E. And he accounts all this, and it's a really good account because it's early. All the prejudices of the later colonial people haven't really come to fruition. And Panay gives, like for the end of the 15th century, a pretty objective account, not so full of the demons are coming like other people do later uh, in, in South America and in Mexico. Panay is more sober in a way, but he, he, he never says he tried the snuffs. Uh, so he sees the native, his Panay's accounts are the first encounter of Europeans with American shamanism. It's in 1494. Uh, and so there's nothing can be early. They're not gone to Mexico yet. So the first encounter of, of Europeans with shamanism is there. You know? And the, the Taino that do wonderful sculptures are make this snuff out of the sister plant, Anadenanthera peregrina, which uh, they both have before need. Next one, please. Okay, and this is like in San Pedro de Atacama, how we find, this is the burial in situ. This is a, a cemetery that we had to excavate because they were making a road and the bulldozers came. And they, they bury people sitting down like you see it, and they knock the headdresses out of a bunch of burials. So we went over, they stopped, they were good about it. They stopped uh, doing the road and, they really, and then they never did it. And then what we excavated there in a rescue operation, 144 burials. Some of them spectacular things. Like, like this man, he was about 45. He had two bows. He had two bundles of arrows. He had an ax here with a blade down. And he was sitting on this, this really thick blankets that they would use. The, the threads were about the thickness of my finger really heavy ones to trek across the Andes. And then on each side, like here and here, he had a snuffing kid hanging on him with this beautiful textile that he did. Let me have the next one, you see the contents. Okay. This, this was inside this. Okay. This is knitted, this is not loom, uh, not, uh, not woven, it's, it's knitting. And so he had the, a little spoon to manipulate the powder, two leather pouches containing the powder, the snuff tray, and the snuffing tube for inhaling it. We were fortunate on this because he had another kid with two more bags, two more pouches of snuff. So he had in total, we calculate about 28 grams of snuff. So he was ready for the afterlife. <laughs> yeah. So fortunately for us, because until then, this is way back when, this is in 91. So everybody that had tried to analyze the snuffs had only access to a small amounts and amounts that were contaminated with dirt. The pouches were busted. And then here we found this, this one. We just pricked a little hole in the bottom and took out the snuff. And a, a, a chemist friend of ours, Dave Rebke, that used to work at the time for Roche Bioscience. And he had, for 91, he had state-of-the-art equipment. So he analyzed this, and he found in it bufotenine, 5 methoxy dmt and DMT. Now, I'm, I should say, though, that the 5-methoxy and the DMT were in very small amounts. If it had any effects, 
probably was the effect of the interaction of the different substances one another. But the main, con the main content was before the knee. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, well, this is the basic component. These are the seeds of an anther. They're about the size of a dime, the size of a penny, a more flat. Uh, so depending on the power, I don't know, you would need five to 10 uh, seeds to feel the effect. Basically, it, to get the full effect, I would say a tablespoon. But imagine it's nothing, a tablespoon up your nose uh, of this material that is not like cocaine, crystallized, I would dissolve in your nose. This is, you know, vegetable material that would clog your nose up and you would then drip mucus out of your nose for a while. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's not painful. Some people, like neighboring people, like the Bororo, and others add ash, ashes to it. Oh, and that is extremely painful to snuff. It really, when you snuff it up, it just goes and it hurts underneath your eyes. That's the worst part. It's, it's, it hurts all the way to here. And it's, you know, it's bad. You try that with us too? Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's uncomfortable. <laughs> But other people, like the people of the Chaco and Northwest Argentina, do not add ash. And it, that doesn't hurt. It, I, I wouldn't say it's a pleasant thing, but yeah, it's okay. Uh, and it, it has a quick, strong effect about, about it, you know. Uh, we have found, we, we visit this chaman in the Chaco. It's by the border with Paraguay, Argentina, and Bolivia. In the corner there, a really isolated area where you know, they haven't been much in pinch with, with people that want goods. Now, well, now that's changed. They found natural gas there, and they, the Wishi, which are the people from there, have been sort of displaced. They were semi-nomadic, and so with this, they have kind of displaced. But we were sitting in this shaman's house, and, I, and there is an abundance of anadenantara in the whole area. When you cross the Andes and you go, I don't know how familiar you are with that area, but the main city is, is called Salta, when you go to Salta, to Tucumán, which is the other city that comes up, the amount of anadenantara is, is incredible. Large pods with about 16 seeds apiece. That, and we started analyzing coming down from Salta, which Salta is about 2,000 meters. And we started analyzing different anadenantras until we got to the central Chaco. And the ones in Salta are two and a half to three percent before the need, but when we got to this chaman's house, that I said, why do you have it there if there are so many? Why do you have it like in a garden, like cultivated? I said, oh, my grandfather planted those. And I figured that this is a special plant. So we collected seeds, we sent it to Dave for analysis, and he, the seeds had 12.4% before the need. He didn't believe it, so he analyzed it three times. And sure enough, it was always like 12 and up. 12 and up, so that in four seeds, you feel the effect. Now, if you think about all the nasty experiments that they did in the 50s, they would always use the salt, the hydrochloride, so that when uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Ott, that went with us to, this, to, to one of these trips that we did, he took the seeds and he extracted the bufotenine. Well, he told me, let's do the bufotenine free base. And, and not, and sure enough, we, we made a mistake because Jonathan said, no, you have to, you have to, you have to snuff 100 milligrams. Oh. It's what it is. And it was an overdose. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, Jonathan is a friendly to, over, to, to high doses, so it's really, was the strongest thing I have ever done. You know, it lasts an hour, an hour and 50, but it was, I, I, of course I've never died, but I would say it has parallels with dying. You know, it's, you were there, and, and so it's, it's, it's highly affected in its free base form. Okay. So, next one, please. I guess I'd better don't go on that many tangents. And this is a, a normal a snuffing kit. This is like a textile band that was wrapping this up, and this is wrapping this bag with the contents that broke on the bottom. And this is this. This is a, this is a magical tube, because that tube has three alloys of that. It has the more pure gold, in the bottom, I mean, in the top, the one in the bottom has some copper on it, and the one in the middle, 
as you can see how red it is, has a high amount of, co of copper. So that the tube has three different alloys in the metal that it wraps. And it was tightly wrapped originally uh, because it has carving in the wood, but it's also uh, the, the, the carving is impressed in the, in the wrapping. You know. uh, this, uh, this is only uh, in San Pedro, everything is so extremely well preserved. You got the next one. Then this is the detail of that, so you see the intricacy of the carving. This is pure Tiwanaku. You see the same mo motif that I had shown you of the genuflect individual holding the staff. And he had uh, the Kogi of the Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta, use elbow, elbow pendants that clack to one another. So I'm assuming that this is same similar thing to that than the ax and the crown. And the, the, the crown has a head, has a leg, in there. We have never found decapitated corpses in San Pedro de Atacama. So if it was, it was a symbolic event. You know? It would be, I guess, like expecting if you are an archaeologist of the future and you go digging a Christian church, you would think, oh, these people would sacrifice a human being every week in the church. But, so, but we never found, because remember, the access that they would use in this period they are not steel things that you would cut a head easy. These were blunt bronze things that you would basically hammer the head off if you wanted to decapitate anybody. So we would see clearly the evidence of the fractured vertebrae and stuff if that was the case. But we, so we never found one at any time. Next one, please. Then this is another one of the Tiwanaku snuff trays from San Pedro de Atacama. We have 61 of these of this type of things. You know. Okay, next. Okay, so let me show you a little bit about Tiwanaku, and then I show you a little bit of Wari, and I'll give you my conclusions of the thing. Okay. Tiwanaku lies here, just a few miles from Lake Titicaca. La Paz, La, La, the present day city of La Paz, like, like over here, right off the map. Okay. Next one. Okay. This is the Bolivian Altiplano, looking east from Tiwanaku. Uh, the photo I'm taking is from about, I'm about almost 14,000 feet. But, and then there's the, Alt the Altiplano that goes all the way down to Uyuni and so forth. These are the higher peaks of the Andes, uh, where then you pass in the Amazon. Yongo will be on the other side of this. Okay. It's, a, 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 it's a beautiful place. I mean, you have to like this arid, treeless landscapes, but then it's, it's just amazing. Okay, next one, please. And this is Tiwanaku from Google Earth. And then you can see that there is like a pattern of things. This is the bigger pyramid. Let me have the next slide. This is the, the bigger pyramid that to, well, today is called Acapana. The, of course, who knows what they called it back then. Acapana, and then there's the semi-subterranean plaza, the bigger place with the sculptures here and here. The famous gate of the sun is over here. Okay, and then this is, it was a residential area here. So it seems, and here was a big gateway. So it seems that the flow of, of the ceremonies and the rituals went this way. And there seemed to, the audience, today they have, let me have the next one. Yeah, and then the big stairways to, this was recently excavated uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, next one, please. Then this is at the top of the pyramid. This is the brewery. The brewery, a brewery capable by calculating from the ceramic vessels that we're having, uh, of, of, of doing per batch over 1,200 liters of, of beer uh, in, in, in here. Okay. Next one, please. Okay. And this is from the brewery looking down into the, to the main ceremonial center with the Ponce sculpture here. And then here is the Sunken Plaza. And then it's, well, this is badly reconstructed, terribly reconstructed. Let me have the next one. Okay. And this is looking west. So when they found this sculpture, that they found there where it's at, but to make it, to make it fancy for the tourist, they stood it up facing east. So that it faces east, the sun rises right on it. But it's fake. The, the sculpture should have been looking south. Should have been looking south towards the pyramid. Because if you calculate how they, because it got, the statue got Christianized, and they opened a pit and they just dumped it in there at some time in the, in the 1500s. Okay, next one. OK, 
Okay, and this is looking the other way. This is more or less like it was. Next one. Okay, and this is how it was in 1870. The, the, the construction of making this wall of stone from here to here is an imagination of the archaeologists that were working at that time. Okay. And they, at that time, they, they were cultivating fields inside of the ceremonial areas, which has caused, of course, for a lot of deterioration. Next one. Okay. And then see how it was. So they, uh, they're pretty large things. So how was it in pre-Columbian times? Okay. Next one. Then, and then inside there was the Ponce Stella. This is three meters high, fully carved everywhere. Let me have the next one. Okay, and this is, Donna and I spent a month in front of this sculpture, figuring out the drawings. Uh, it, it is totally surrounded by the attendant profile figures, the, the headdress has, and they have like processions, processions that would meet like that, and would meet like that in a, in a frontal figure here, and they would come over, and they were holding snuff tray and a snuffing kit. I'll show you a photo so, you, so that you, uh, confirm my interpretation or not. Okay, let me have the next one. Okay, this is what it holds in the hand. And uh, look at the position of the hand. It's an imp this is used commonly throughout the Andes. It's what we call a half fist, because it's like this. No? But this is an impossible position. You know, I cannot, I cannot do that. If I put my thumb down, it's like this. So I cannot. I cannot do it. It's, it's, it's uh, an artificial position, if you want to call it that. Okay. It like, or like, you know, so because you see the four fingers and the thumb, if I do that, I don't, you know. Okay, next one, you'll see how. So this is how the drawing is, and this is here. And at some point in the 1500s, it, it, they Christianized the sculpture. And, and then they open a pit, and they dumped it in the pit. This happened to several others, sculptures like that. They become Christianized, and then they get the pose. Okay, next one. Okay, so see here is a snuff tray and the snuffing kit on, on each side, so that I think that that's what's going on, that they had it like that. So in a way, it's interesting because it's a, do a, a public display of psychedelic use in this monumental sculpture. That is, it is a state approve or stay uh, use of, of psychedelics. Okay. Next one. Okay, and see this is two Tiwanaco trays with their corresponding tombs that would be uh, there. Okay, next one. Okay, and then this is a half fist a snuff tray, like the same position of the hand. Okay. Okay. okay, next one. Okay, and this is some of the sculptures of Tiwanaco all in that plaza that I show you. The most famous, the Gate of the Sun, then the Bennett monolith. This is much bigger than that one. This is large, but it was made with this limestone that has made it flake out, while the Ponce was made with andesite that is much more stronger, and it has, well, it's like, other than a few uh, loses around here and there, mostly in the head, it's in fairly good shape. Uh, well, and then this is another one that is earlier that they call the Fraile since the colonial times because there's supposed similarity with a friar. Okay. Uh, so none of this exists in Wadi. The Wadi are sculptures, the biggest Wadi sculptures are about like this. Okay, okay next one. Okay, so let's proceed to Wadi now. So there is an interface between Wadi and Tiwanaku here but nothing seemed to have happened there uh, as far as hostilities between these two people. Okay, and then there's Cerro Baul, which I'll show you is a, an important offering site of about easy 3,000 years of continuous offering, including today. Okay, next one. Okay, so this is the typical Wadi constructions. As you can see, this is a much more rough stone, uh, and they, instead of doing these sunken plazas, they do this D-shaped plazas. That is the most common kind of thing on it. Next one, there, see? And they organized this D-shaped structures around what seem to have been domestic st uh, 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 occupations. Next one, okay. And the Wadi sculptures tends to be small like this, 10 centimeters, you know. Uh, easy measurement, 30 centimeters is 
about a foot. So this ten is a little thing like this. And so this is more. So portable sculpture, really. OK, next. Okay, and these are a comparison of Wadi and Tiwanaku textiles. This is Wadi. This is Tiwanaku. This is the regular attendant figure. And then this, well, is a, is, is a decomposition of the, of the figure. Here you see, so they make this module, and this module is repeated throughout. So but you can see this is the, the head, the mouth, the eye, then the wing, and they kind of break it apart and then compose it up again into, into these things that they flip-flop to one another. Okay. And you see this one is the complete wraparound, no seam here, and this has the seam over here, which is a typical thing for Wadi. Okay. It's kind of a, I guess it's a technical issue of the difficulties of weaving, if you want to see it that way. Or maybe it was a preference, because in the Andes, everything in these days, the, the torsion of the thread is, has value. So that from the moment that the thing is constructed from scratch, when they start spinning the yarn, there is a torsion that is either S or Z. So that they, when you combine the two of them, they, it, it produces a tension in the structure of the thing itself that seems to be, have been loaded with meaning for them. Okay, next one. Okay, and this is another one of those. Okay, okay next. Okay. And then this is a full geometric wadi thing that is practically, it, this became famous back in the 50s when there was like a big show in the Museum of Modern Art of, uh, of doing modernism and so forth. So this was very much in the taste of abstract art of the 50s. Okay. So it's, and then it became very, desired by collectors. So a lot of plundering uh, occurred throughout the, that area of the southern Peruvian coast of excavating illegally for this thing. So there's got to be well, at least 200 wadi tunics out in the market while, uh, and in private collections of a while. There is maybe 15 Tiwanaku tunics, of which 10 are in San Pedro de Atacama. Uh, uh, San Pedro de Atacama was mostly excavated by a Jesuit priest that excavated insanely a lot, but he would refuse to let anything get out of San Pedro. He would not sell anything, so everything is in the collection of the, of the museum in San Pedro de Atacama. Uh, and he was jealous about it. You, you couldn't do anything getting out of here. He was known to, to people that would plunder a site he would just chase him with his own car. He had a little Volkswagen bug, and he would chase him out and stop him and call the police and retrieve the objects. So that was good. His excavations were not the best archaeological things, but the stuff is there, all of that there. Yeah. Uh, so you see the same with the central weave and the same thing of, of the head, see the teeth, the eye, and then the wing on the side, making this wonderful geometric textiles. These are big. Uh, uh, these tunics are about four feet wide and generally it's good because you can wrap yourself with it because they have no, no sleeves. It's a thing like this when it's woven, it's woven with two slit here, slit here, and slit here, and then it gets folded over and it's stitched on the side. Okay. And they, uh, so it is, it's warm, say, because we figure uh, uh, the physical anthropologists that works with us have seen some uh, wear and tear on the bones over here. So we figure they might have slept sitting down. Okay. okay, let me hurry up, otherwise I won't finish. The next one. Okay, look at this. And let me have the next one. Yeah. They're wonderful textiles. They, what they do. Next one, please. Okay, and this is uh, Wari drinking. This is serving wear. This is about like this. Okay. And this is how they took it to the feast. Okay. And there you see you have the same, the, the thing like that. Next one, please. Okay. And this uh, is representations of an Adhanantra in different drinking vessels. You can see it here, here, and you can see it here uh, in the, the pods hanging from, the, from this tree that comes out of this head. And then you see the, the parts there. 
The next one, please. This is a reconstructed vessel from Wari also, with this representation of what it's a, Colin would probably talk more about this, so I don't want to dwell too much in it. But this is a representation of one possible another Antara representation. Next, please. Okay, and then this is Cerro Baul. Cerro Baul is next, please. It's this whole flat top mesa. Next one, please. Okay. Then you can see it here. Today, and, and then this is the Wadi site, and this is present day offerings. People, when you climb now, you generally, people are climbing too. Next one. This is, it takes about, for a non athletic person like me uh, and Donna, it takes us about two and a half hours to get to the top. There is a, there is a you don't have to climb, there is a path that takes you up. But this is high enough already. And then, out of breath, you have to climb this place. So it took us two and a half hours to get to the top. But then, we, yeah, let me have the next one. Yeah, you see, it's an imposing monument in a way. Next one. Okay, and then when you get to the top, you, well, along the road, when you have the cliff wall here, people have dug little holes. Like, see, this is uh, tobacco offerings, cigarettes offerings on the way. So people take their their cigarettes and they stuck it there and they pray uh, our father uh, Christian prayers and then they and they put the tobacco there okay. and then when you get to the top you find that people have constructed these things the whole top is full of this like here this person has made a house with a city with a path like with, with a corral uh, and you can it has doors and uh, cardboard doors, and it's like wishful thinking, really, in a way. Uh, and the whole place is full of it. And this place has been the subject of offerings easily for 3,000 years, of constant offerings. And people use it today. When we were climbing, there were people behind us and in front of us. And there. So it's, there, there are others like that, no? Next, please. Okay. And this is what you see. Let me show you this here. This is a water structure. Next one. Okay, this is, the, now realize the next one. Okay, and this is the water structure with the brewery here. Now, one difficulty, realize you're way up there. You cannot make a well. Whatever water you want to take for making your chisha, you got to carry it up, up there. So it, it wasn't like, a, uh, like an easy thing. Okay, next one. Then, and then there's a, a different thing, the milling room fermentation, the boiling. Realize to make shisha, you have, you have to procure the grain. You have to select the grain. Then you have to grind it. Then you have to boil it. And then you ferment it. So it is an operation. You have to make the building to start with. So you need people to do this. It's not a simple affair. And so next one. And so in the, in the case of Wadi, their imperial thing was that the, the chicha was made with moye. Moye is California pepper and that has little sacks of sugar inside. So, so that it makes a real potent chicha. Well, potent here will be 5%. You know, it's not like an outrageous thing. So in here, they had 12 ceramic baths lining the patio and where the liquid would age for three to five days where it ferment. And each of these vessels would hold 150 liters of, of beer. So you could do a, a batch of fermentation would give you 1,800 liters, of, which is, you know, wait, I gotta be cutting down, I got five minutes left. Next one. Okay, and then these are the San Pedro de Atacama. So I just make the final comparison over here. For, for the chicha, as I was telling you, you need people. You need people to move from one place to another. You need the people that are going to make the chicha. But then for snuffing, you, the seeds travel from Northwest Argentina. It's the, and they travel in llama caravans that get exposed to stops in different areas. And there is, the stories get added, different techniques and different admixture plants to the snuff. So the snuff moves and it doesn't need other people than the caravan traders, it doesn't need uh, ideological envoys from the, colonial, from the government center. 
they, they come and they move and they flow into the different outlying communities of San Pedro and they take the ideology with them. They, they take, so that it's not necessary a militaristic things. You know, they, then, you know, I, one day I took the 62 Tiwanaco trays and I put it in a large table. I was trying to see if there were different hands in the making of this. I was trying to find the artists that made it and I totally failed. There is not one tray that I could say in this place that it was made by the same person. So what it does says to me is that this is circulated over these vast areas and they got to change and modify and add things so that the militaristic endeavors of Wadi related to drinking alcohol and the expansion of Tiwanaco related to snuffing uh, DMT related things produce a political impact that was totally different in one from the other. I mean, this is, I'm assuming here, and this is the failure of my argument, that alcohol will provoke these domineering attitudes, while the, the tryptamine snuffs will produce a more anarchic form of organization. Which is the way I like to think of it as a more utopian thing, but uh, I think that there is perhaps a tiny bit of truth in what I see there. And so, but anyway, the fact is that in San Pedro de Atacama, there are no foreigners. Everybody is local, but everybody uses Tiwanaco objects. So, uh, uh, our daughter is a physical anthropologist, and they have investigated in the different burials by doing a strontium analysis of the teeth enamel, and they found no presence of outside of foreigners from the area, while in Wadi you find clearly these foreign entities that have come in uh, and exercise control. So my point in it is that this kind of differentiation in them can be explained by, by the drugs they use and how they use them, one basing them in alcohol, in, in, in this alcoholic ayahuasca, which I don't, I don't know anybody that's done it in recent years. Uh, there are accounts of it from the 1600s, but uh, anybody here tried uh, uh, ayahuasca, alcoholic ayahuasca, or alcohol huasca? No, no, nobody I know. So it's, it's, it's I hesitate to try it. <laughs> well, the, yeah, number one, we don't know how many seeds you need to put in there, when in the fermentation process you should include it, and what the dosage is. So you are just jumping into an unknown thing, so, I don't encourage you to, to try it, but I do encourage you to try it. Because it'd be nice to know. <laughs> it'd be nice to know. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to be a guinea pig on this because I'm getting up in age. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah. So, it's kind of thing. But I think that there is some truth there into how this interaction went place and how it affected the politics of the political entities. You know, it's things. So, when I, I bet, so you can see all of this, and this is only a fraction of it. We, we have, like I said, 61 of these. Okay. I have an article on this in, in ResearchGate that, that is like a catalog. I have all of, the, all of the snuff trays in there. So if you search my name in ResearchGate, this article, will, it was published by the Co Co Institute of Archaeology in California. Uh, and, it's, and the nice thing about this book is a, it's a, it's a book that is called Images in Action. And it's like a large book that has about 700 illustrations. So if you go to the UCLA site that is called dig.ucla, all of the images of the book are there in high resolution. Okay. It's not very clear, but if you click the images, it keeps on growing. You know. <laughs> so it's, yeah. so, and also the interesting part, I think, of this, of the, of the thing, of, uh, of this tray circulating, is that of course, when something circulates, a ritual object like this circulates, stories go with it. Uh, and, and, and different uh, technologies go with it. How to make the snuff, what to add, what other plant to put in there. So that, that is the, the nice thing about caravan trades with, of ritual objects. What we don't know is if the ritual objects travel by themselves in a special alternative route, or if they came with the regular goods. You know, it's, uh, I think it came with the regular goods. It would be kind of too complicated uh, logistically to just separate ritual objects and normal uh, like food items or metals or whatever. So I think they travel together. 
So that's what is really kind of a fascinating thing for me, is how this thing is spread and how ideas were exchanged and how stories were exchanged and how the population became more diverse in that way. Okay. Well, I think I better quit. I've run my time. Uh, so if you want to know more, check this uh, book. So, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any, any, any question you would like to ask? Okay. All right, we've got a question over here. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have, um, I'd like to know if uh, what the seeds were um, being ground up with, what was the grinding um, object, and if it was one or... or oh, little uh, stone mortars, small, relatively small, uh, something like this, you know, with a man on it. And, and, and then if there's any um, repeating origin of the clays used for the tablets... And no, if they're they, wood. They're all wood, okay. Yeah. I thought. yeah, yeah, clay wouldn't be a good thing for snuffing. Yeah. You know, you realize you'd be snuffing mostly so dirt. It's, and, and were they adorned with, the, with shells? That was my final... Yes, 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 they do. They, uh, there is a lot, of, a lot of shells that come, uh, of sweet water snails that come from northwest Argentina. Uh, they sound about like that. And they mostly used for, for pigments. A lot of red ochre pigments when we find them in San Pedro. So it, it showed like a clear pattern of trade between Northwest Argentina, where the seeds are from, and the local stuff. Because we, you know, there's quite a bit of these snail shells. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, curious to know what the climate and topography was like when these kind of cities and ritual sites were built. Was it the same as it is today? Was it colder, wetter? Then what, has it always been the same? It's, well, it, it's an oasis, it's San Pedro, for example, that lies at the, as two rivers come, one comes from the higher mountains, and that one comes more from the north, and they become real close, and then they unite together, and they mm -hmm. form the, the oasis that to, there is a, the salt flats on the other side of the oasis. Uh, today it's all changing, because salt flats are full of lithium, so the there are a lot of those ponds that people make to evaporate the lithium, and then they dump the water back into the salt flat, and they are altering the total uh, composition of the, of, the, of the salt flats. Like it's happening in Bolivia, in Uyuni, and, and it's bad because, it's, because all the times mining employs people, but the extraction of lithium is minimal employment. Not that that would make it any better, but at least it would, be, it would give people some food. But lithium is... For us making our electric cars, we are having a tremendous impact in these landscapes where lithium is being extracted. It's, uh, so yeah, we are being real ecological driving our Teslas and whatever, but when you look at the origins of the lithium, you know, and, about, and it's also, it's raining now. In, in, in the old days, I was gonna say, you no, know, when we first started going there in the 80s, it would, they would spend six, seven months there and never would rain a drop. And now it rains. And the houses are not fit for that. So, and they are adobe houses. So I remember one time, as, you know, waking up in the middle of the night when it was raining and the juncture of the roof was leaking through and the wall was like melting. You know, there like that. So it's, the, I don't know if this is due to general climate change. I think it does. But it is raining and it's raining quite a bit. So the, the whole composition of the place is changing. Yeah. And these are small oases. San Pedro is like a bottle because it's a canyon and it's like this. So at the, at the maximum width over here, maybe it's half a mile. And then in north-south like that, it's about 10, 11 miles. So it's, it's a small oasis that, and the water is, the water is terrible. It's, you can, there's no bacteria because there's so much minerals. San Pedro Atacama water has arsenic, has borax, has salt, uh, and a whole host of other uh, chemicals on it. Like, you know, our kids, because we will go with our kids since they were little, so we buy bottled water. But you bathe them with hot water. And that is terrible because the skin absorbs all of this highly mineralized water. Yeah. San Pedro de Atacama is one of the places with the highest content of arsenic in the water that people use. And the people you water the crops with this. You know? 
Uh, and so everything is loaded with this stuff. So yeah, the, 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 the teeth are, when we excavate uh, the old burials, the teeth is like, it's painful to see them. You know, we, we I remember we told this one guy up that he, he had an axis, he was a man, he had an axis that the, the bone was here, the bone related up here was like a sponge, it was all pitted on top of his. Uh, we had a guy that his jaw was fused. So he knocked the two teeth out so that he could eat through there. And so oh, wow. this was accumulation of practically cement on the jaw, you know. So it wasn't. It wasn't an easy life, you know. It, even for us, that you know, it, it was it was hard. You dry up. Uh, it's the the, uh, the ambient humidity is less than ten percent. So when you're there a month, your whole body dries up. You know, you you bend over to pick something up, you feel your back go. You the skin crackle basically. Yes. So if, and the lips crack and the knuckles crack. It's, so you get used to it after about two or three months. You, you get used to your body begins to adapt. So I, I, I tell you, for those of you that work in the jungle, going with children to the desert is much easier. Because I remember when you would come home after being in Pucallpa and your kids would go to our pediatrician, they had all kinds of stuff. You know, they had ear infections, they had amoebas, they had all kinds of things. We would come back from San Pedro de Atacama and our kids had dry skin, but <laughs> <laughs> that's about it. Okay, any, any other questions or we can call it quit? Yeah. Yeah, uh, over here. Where I'm, are you? I'm wondering, uh, right, right here. To, uh, uh, well, right it doesn't matter. Over here. Oh. <laughs> so any indication of um, whether women or men were, were brewing? Probably women were brewing. Yeah. Okay. Probably women. It's, right. it's today it is women. Yeah, I, I uh, chewed chicha um, with a group of women yeah. and spit it. Um, because yeah. pitolin and the, the enzyme in the mouth was so important for yeah. um, uh, helping the carbohydrate translate, yeah. uh, transition to sugar. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it was all yeah, uh, initially done by virgins. I, I think I it is. I think it was like it is today. Yeah. Yeah, women, but you know, we can only suppose. In the case of the snuffs, we the snuffing equipment is with men. Well, but like I said, it doesn't mean the women were not using it. It just means that they didn't carry this stuff to, with them to the grave. Uh, a hair analysis would solve that issue, but it seems that, that DMT is not easily absorbed through the follicles. Such a Shulgi would tell me that it, it was not, uh, it didn't have enough fat it, it was to, to go into the hair. So. Uh, maybe if we could find a metabolite, it would say, like with cocaine, you got benzoecognine, that the text that there was cocaine used, even if the cocaine alkaloid is gone. In a certain way, one, my own um, paranoid individual, uh, I don't think we should do such a test. It would be giving a weapon to the police to detect DMT use in post today. So I, I'd rather not know about the past and provide this tool for repressive authorities. I think most of you would agree with me. Anybody else? Yes, we have one more question over here. Um, why do you say that is bufotin in the main active components in the tablets, uh, while in the pipes, just comparing pipes and tablets, uh, yeah, we, we found that there is more 5-methoxy DMT than bufotenine? No, it, it's, it's much less than bufotenine. We have analyzed the pouches. The pouch, like now, just two weeks ago, uh, this team from the University of Miami presented at the Society of American Archaeology uh, several samples, including pipe, smoking pipe balls and nicotine, uh, but they also, they found bufotenine, 5-methoxy, DMT, but also, remarkably enough, they found harmine. Harmaline. Eh? Harmaline. Which is not to run and say, oh, they were importing banisteriopsis from the jungle, which is like a crazy idea. Because how much, I mean, basically, how much banisteriopsis you need for one dose? About like that, no? So imagine how many Yama caravans you would need bringing this. I think the, the, the thing to inquire is to inquire the local flora. Yeah. 
and see if there was something that had before the, uh, uh, harmine or harmaline on it, which is possible. Some species of prosopis, prosopis is like algarrobo, have harmine and harmaline in the leaves. So I think the, the solution would be to look at the, at the local flora, not think, oh, they brought this a habitat of, uh, of an stereopsis. It isn't even in the southern periphery of the Amazon. It's towards the northern. So and it is thousands of miles of rough landscape, not easy to bring. So I, I think it's like a couple of articles that have appeared, like the one that appeared recently in antiquity. Uh, they just go and rush into saying it's Banisteriopsis and they're making ayahuasca there. Yeah, sure, they probably were making ayahuasca, but not the recipe that we think of. You know, you know the, the local environment should be investigated before you come on with these far-fetched theories, you know. Of, eh? An ayahuasca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that is is potent enough, you know, to, to do it. Anybody here has tried it? Yeah, well, well you need it. No, you got it. Uh, yeah. I just want two quick questions. Um, Howard Fabian published a paper in 1956 in which he injected bufotenin into a bunch of prisoners. Right. And, and uh, that often was cited as evidence of the psychoactive nature of bufotenin, but when you really read the paper, no one got psychoactive results. So I was curious about what was going on then if, if bufotenin is psychoactive. And my second question is, do we have any evidence as to who exactly was using these snuffs? Was it just the elite? Or, you know, in the same way after the conquest, there was a kind of a meme that went around that only the Inca used coca. Well, we know that wasn't true. Do no. you feel that with the amount of that in the Nanthra that was being shipped up, this and, and the way that it was used in rituals in Chicha, do you think this is a common, w w were, were there common people in ritual moments imbibing this beverage? I, if you see the amount of, of, of stuffing equipment we have in San Pedro de Atacama, which is the best excavated place, you have to say that it was widespread in the population. Uh, like, like uh, in total, like we have 500 snuffing kits that, that are in the museum collection. So you figure that we haven't found all of them. So that you found that there is 500 that we've been able to locate. This was used widespread in the population. Now, for the answer to the bufotenin psychoactivity, I'll speak about my own experience. I'll say it's the only thing we. Uh, we extracted bufotenin in the free base form from the seeds from the chaco. And I, I snuff 100 milligrams. We, we just took the crystals and we made a line and, snor and snorted as if it was coke. And we went and I had never uh, had such a strong experience. It was, I don't know if you will, I would say it's psychoactive, but the effect itself, what was perplexing to me and what was difficult to grasp with my mind is that the visions, what you saw, like normally when we see the world, we see it through light and dark. You know, this whole world for me here is defined by light and dark. But this thing that I was seeing, if you want to call it seeing, was not defined by light and dark. It, it was this strange thing that I had difficulty in, in wrapping my head around it. But, but I, I would consider that a psychedelic experience. Yeah. And what, you know, and this is when the one thing that would, one thing that made me reconcile with this is a voice in my own head, myself, uh, would, would say, no, this is the, sp the space where death happens. No, not, uh, and I thought I was dying, really. Uh, for Donna was freaking out with it. Oh my God! You know, but yeah, it, it was it was really a a, a different thing, like uh, like DMT or ayahuasca, for example. Poisoning or was it psychoactive? What? I mean, was it being poisoned or was it actually? No, I felt normal. I didn't feel any heart or respiratory or respiratory problems at all. It was just my difficulty in coming to terms with this kind of experience. You know, but no, I never felt like people reporting those things in those experiments that you were talking, respiratory problems or pressure in the chest. No, I, I felt totally fine. Uh, language was, language, I was doing it, uh, I was doing it with Jonathan Ott, and Jonathan always speaks Spanish to me. And in this event, I, I switched 
to Spanish in talking to him, and Jonathan switched to English. So there was this kind of language thing that, that came about of, of switching around that was interesting. It, it lasted about an hour and 50 minutes, uh, more or less. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, thanks a lot for your attention. You've been a more kind audience.